Hello and welcome to Harpy Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. On today's program, we travel to the YK Delta, that's the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta in southwestern part of Alaska. We take a look at an issue that's affecting the lives in a bad way of our Native people. And it's not just the people in the YK Delta. It's all over America and all over Alaska. The issue is tobacco use. The use of tobacco not only affects those who use tobacco, but even those around them that don't use tobacco. The effects are devastating, and today we meet a young man whose life has been drastically changed by his past tobacco use. And we also take a look at the history of tobacco use and Alaska Natives. People of Alaska are made up of many different nations, languages, and ways of knowing. They all share one thing, survival, in the rugged conditions of this great land called Alaska. It wasn't until contact with European civilization in the early 1700s that the native people of Alaska learned the meaning of the word addiction. For it was the early Russian explorers that introduced tobacco to the innocence of Alaska's aboriginal people. Tobacco use was never in our culture. Our ancestors never used tobacco. It was unknown to them. It was introduced by explorers in the early 1700s and by the late 1700s Alaska natives were addicted and uh, they could ask for tobacco by name that's what one of the explorers wrote and from the logs of English explorer Robert F Spencer was written nearly everyone used tobacco in some form including the children besides smoking many chewed the leaves Explorer Captain Beachy wrote, The northern Eskimos generally smoked a short pipe, while some to the south of Bering Strait chewed tobacco, and the St. Lawrence Islanders took it as snuff. Countless other logs of explorers explain how tobacco was commonly used as means of trade, payment, and reward. Today, however, tobacco has evolved into a social function, with children of all ages using tobacco regularly. To many of the people of rural Alaska, tobacco, in many forms, has been accepted into their culture. Meet Roderick Dementiff of Bethel, Alaska. Roderick smoked cigarettes for most of his life. I started to smoke when I was 13 just because my friends were smoking and I wanted to join the crowd and fit in just like everybody else. In, in those days, anybody could buy it, even kids, teenagers, in those days. It used to be 35 cents a pack and everybody would sell it. They didn't care to who, they just sold it. I was at fish camp and our fish camp is about 200 feet up from the river. I had to rush about three times before I even reached the house at fish camp. And my wife and mother-in-law told me to come to the hospital. And I never quit coming. That's because on his visit to the hospital, Roderick was given some very discouraging news. My doctor 
she diagnosed me as having a um, bullet, I think. It's not bola, it's a bullet, and it's a very bad emphysema. And I was on oxygen for about a year. You, you go to the store and buy grapes. That's how your lungs look with little pockets all over. Mine were like shopping bags. The little, little, little bags popped. And I was breathing in bad air. Because I couldn't push all my air out. They said I had to get an operation. I'd lose 40 per, well, they said only one side I'd lose part of my lung. But when I was on the operating table, they looked at the other side, and the other side was just as bad as the other one, so they took out 40% of my lungs. Now I got hardly any lungs. I get blood into my muscles and my fingers and toes. It's always hard for me to walk. Nowadays, I can't even work. I can't lift things. It's hard for me to bend down. I'm on pills, probably for the rest of my life. For Roderick Dementiff, and for so many other Alaska Natives as well, life has changed dramatically because of tobacco. And for the youth of rural Alaska, if the same pattern of tobacco use and addiction continues, the outcome will be similar. Do you see this? In southeast Alaska, it's called bear bread. In other parts of the state, they have different terms, but in the YK Delta, it's punk ash, and it's the source of what they call ikmik. We take a look at ikmik in this upcoming segment. Also, tobacco use is growing all over the state, particularly among our youth, and we'll take a look at how it's affecting our native youth. Over 50% chew tobacco. Underage. There's more underage chewers than they are under overage. Here in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, or YK Delta, the smokeless tobacco use rate amongst Alaska natives is 52% versus 2% nationally. The YK Delta has an extremely high rate of respiratory disease in babies and young people. In fact, cancer is the leading cause of death in the YK Delta region. How old are you? 13. Uh, did, when did you start using tobacco? I started using tobacco two or three years ago. I don't know how I started. Uh, when I, I tried I tried tobacco the first time when I I think I was a, a little kid. And where did you get the tobacco? My grandpa. How, how often do you do it? Two, three, or four times a day. And uh, is that every single day? I. Uh, yep. I first started using um, chewing tobacco when I was about, I'd say about eight years old. I started uh, smoking when I was 17. Well, about 16, I used to sneak cigarettes from my dad and mom. I was about 10 or 11, uh, just experimenting. When I was a little boy, I used to use tobacco ever since I was about 13 years old. Within the Alaska Native population, we're seeing double the addiction rates. Um, and we're seeing 50 times the smokeless tobacco use rates in this region than we see nationally. Growing up, you see it everywhere. Everyone uses it. Everyone makes it. You see little kids um, chewing what we call ikmik, or now Copenhagen. Um, so it's just everywhere. Everywhere you turn, you see kids using it. And it's nothing that's discussed very much. It's just 
like a way of life? They start at a very young age, maybe like four years old and up. There's a lot of elementary kids using it too. In my village, uh, uh, they start off young, like three, four, and uh, they, about 95% of the youth in my area are chewing tobacco, mostly black bull. Alarmingly, people in this region mix smokeless tobacco with an ash that they get from burning a fungus that grows on birch trees with their tobacco. This mixture, known as ikmik or black bull, raises the pH level in the user's mouth, and that increases the amount of nicotine that's absorbed and the speed at which it's delivered, which makes it highly addictive. The molecules are unprotonated in this case, so the user is actually freebasing the nicotine. One of my friends had some uh, black bullen. That's what we call ikmik. It's it's a black bull. It's like homemade nicotine. He asked me if I wanted to try it, and I got a little curious, so I tried it. Sometimes they don't have to spend money on tobacco. They get it through other people, their parents. Friends, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and older siblings. I don't see very much like opposition to it because um, grandparents even um, have their grandchildren or younger ones make it for them. Like um, I used to make it for my grandmother when I was very young. And tobacco was not only directly linked to cancer, including head neck and oral cancers, but is also known to cause chronic hypertension and increases the risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease. Well, no one ever told us how bad it was or um, uh, everyone did it. <laughs> and it was never looked at as a bad thing. It was like uh, uh, adults could see you smoking and wouldn't care. They'd even offer you cigarettes when you were little. Well, the elders themselves use tobacco. Um, their, their, their kids use tobacco. So, you know, a lot of the kids feel that it's okay, it's right for them to use tobacco. I guess they didn't know it was harmful to them. Nobody knew. We didn't know, parents didn't know. And uh, when young people like myself, I started experimenting at an early age and when children become hooked, they start giving them tobacco, buy them tobacco. They say that uh, if, if you don't give them permission to use tobacco, they could start stealing to support their habits. About, I'd say about 60% of our shoplifting um, cases in all the stores are, they're trying to, they are trying to steal tobacco. And every, every single burglary in a store that I've worked on, that um, my officers have worked on, has involved theft of tobacco. Oh, this is a brand new one from today. Oh. Carrie Enoch is a nicotine dependence treatment counselor for the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation in Bethel, Alaska. Carrie is a success story in the sense that she went from chewing tobacco to counseling those who want to become tobacco free. I started experimenting with tobacco when I was about eight years old. At my first prenatal, uh, the doctor I saw asked me if I used tobacco and I said yes and she told me that tobacco could harm my baby. I wanted to have a normal, healthy baby, uh, a smart child. That's, that was my reason for quitting. Unfortunately, quitting tobacco use during pregnancy is not the common practice. In fact, YKHC research of medical charts shows that 82% of pregnant women in the YK Delta region use tobacco. 61% of those women use ICMIC or a commercial brand. 
It is the popular belief that ikmik is safer than commercial tobacco because it comes from nature and is not treated with chemicals or preservatives. This perception that ikmik is safer or healthier is simply not true. No tobacco use is benign. Actually, when used as indicated, tobacco is the only product sold in the United States that kills. The health risks to that young person, the chances of, of premature death, uh, complications with respiratory illnesses, cancer, and so on, it's absurd that anybody would want to encourage uh, young people to take up the habit and become addicted to nicotine. Well, as you can see, it's going to take teamwork among our own people to keep our villages tobacco-free, to get them tobacco-free to begin with. And let's take a look at how the state of Alaska is working towards that goal. Leroy Davis is the Tobacco Enforcement Coordinator for the Division of Public Health. He has been preparing training materials for distribution to store owners and sales clerks to help them comply with state laws, laws that prohibit the sale of any tobacco products to children under the age of 19. Leroy is also working with local police officers and health and social service investigators to conduct investigations around rural Alaska to make sure that stores in the remote parts of the state are abiding by the law and are not selling tobacco products to underage buyers. Last year, investigations revealed that an alarming number of rural tobacco sellers, more than 70 percent, were ignoring the law and letting minors buy tobacco. Last year in our surveys, and, and we only went to a limited number of, of rural establishments, but we found that nearly, or actually over 70 percent of those businesses were willing to sell to the underage youth that we had go in and attempt to buy. 70% uh, is, is totally unacceptable. Uh, our statewide rate is well under 30%, and hopefully this year will be substantially less than that. And the, the federal rate maximum that the federals uh, ask us to achieve is 20%. If the state fails to make the federally mandated 20% non-compliance rate, then the penalty that the law specifies is that Alaska could lose up to 40% of the funding it receives now for substance abuse treatment programs. Those are community-based programs. And so if we were to lose 40% of the funds that, that are helping communities deal with substance abuse, not just tobacco, but other substance abuse in their communities, the, the ripple effect could, could be enormous. One camera lights. Can I please see your ID? Our policy is anybody that is, looks under the age of 30 is to be ID'd. Uh, we keep at our check stands a calendar that says uh, at what date they were born, they're allowed to buy tobacco. It used to be uh, younger kids would stand out on the front porch and they would have older kids come in, uh, people that are old enough to buy tobacco. In the past, we have had phone calls where parents will say, I'm sick, I don't feel well, I'm sending my child, and we just, just assure them that that is not something that we can do here in our store. Um, we do not allow children to pick up cigarettes for their parents at all. And with good cause, if a store is caught selling tobacco to an underage buyer, the consequences can be devastating for first-time offenders. Our employees will be fined themselves if they are caught selling to minors uh, and also the store manager and the store itself will be fined uh, if we are caught in, in non-compliance also we lose our sale license for 20 days to start and then it gets progressively higher after that the penalties can increase up to twenty five hundred dollars and a total of a year's suspension if there have been a number of previous violations at that business if a business loses uh, through the suspension of its tobacco endorsement, if it loses the privilege of selling tobacco for 20 days or 45 days or 90 days or a year, there are a number of consequences we can anticipate. Uh, one is the smokers in the community will probably have to go cold turkey because not only will he not be selling to, uh, to young people and children, He's not going to be selling tobacco products to anyone during that period of suspension. 
but on a more serious note, the, the impact of lost revenue can affect the workers in the store. It could result in a layoff. And as unfortunate as that is, that, that could be a downstream consequence. In the past, the illegal sale of tobacco products to minors fell primarily in the laps of store owners. But nowadays, with the realization of the enormously devastating effect tobacco has on health, it is becoming clear that the responsibility of keeping tobacco away from the kids belongs to the communities, to the store owners, the moms and dads, the grandparents, our elders, the ones who should know better. Let's understand the responsibility that the business person has. Let's understand the responsibility that the adults in the community, parents, uh, uncles, aunts, neighbors, older brothers and sisters, we all have a responsibility to see that these kids get a chance to reach adulthood without developing the addiction to, not, to nicotine or being subjected to the potential health hazards. And it's also a responsibility that law enforcement in these rural villages is working to take control of. Here in the police department, we do cite um, minors in possession of tobacco. We, if we see them smoking, we do cite them. If we find out that they're chewing, we do give them the citations. But handing out citations is only one small part of a bigger answer to the problem at hand. Understanding the very real and very frightening health consequences of tobacco use is the prevention medicine for this addiction that has stolen the vitality of the native communities of rural Alaska. Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to start educating the kids. I mean, not just sticking a one-hour class every year on tobacco use. I mean, start it from, you know, head start, kindergarten, first grade. Start it when they're young so that when you teach it to them, they remember. Education for both adults and children is perhaps one of our strongest tools as Alaska Natives. It will take time and patience, but with the dedication of our elders, adults, youth, and agencies, together we can return abstinence from tobacco to tradition. I want to thank those that were interviewed on Heartbeat Alaska for this story in particular, those that live in the villages. It took a lot of courage to step out and speak of using ICNIC and tobacco use. It took a lot of courage because on television everyone sees that. These are the type of people that are my heroes, people that want to affect change in the lives of others, even through demonstration of their mistakes. And again, thank you so much for helping Heartbeat Alaska and our viewers. We really appreciate that. And I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Join me again next week for more Native news and information. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless every single one of you.